it used to bother me when I would do these interviews and then everybody makes their joke about, oh, they're sitting in front of Taylor, like everybody's going to lie or over-exaggerate, whatever. That used to really bother me because I felt what people don't understand about interviewing, or at least with me, is that charisma is a skill. Making people feel comfortable is a skill. Being able to sit in a chair and get somebody to tell you something they've never said before is a skill. Now, because maybe to you, I make it look very easy, you are diminishing that skill to how I look. This is how I am. This is how I do the job. When I realized that you just had to focus on that aspect of it, all that other stuff stopped mattering. Welcome, everybody, to another Boardroom Talks. For me, a very special one, long overdue. I am sitting with my dear friend and media star, (laughs) Miss Taylor Rooks. Welcome. Hello, Rich. Thank you so much for having me. Truly, I love watching you do these talks, so I'm very excited that I get to be in the seat. Although I don't always love being interviewed, you are a special case. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. I'm happy you're here. (laughs) Of course. We really have been trying to do this for a while. Mm -hmm. But I think it happened right at the time it was supposed to happen. I I think you're right. I think everything happens at the time it's supposed to happen. I think you're right. <laughs> and I think I have to be sensitive to how busy you are. I'm moving. I'm on a plane a lot. It's fun, but yeah, I don't I don't get a lot of rest. I don't. So you do Thursday night football with Amazon. Yep. You do the NBA on TNT. Yeah. You have a show called X on Max. Yep. And obviously, too personal with joy. Yes. Yeah. Would you say you're living a dream right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a dream that I really don't think I could have even imagined. I was thinking about this the other day, funny enough, like when I very first got into the business or even thought about wanting to do this, my goal was that I one day wanted to have my own show. I was like, I'm going to get my own show. And that's when I'll know that I I made it. I'm doing the thing that I want to do. That's my dream. But then I got my own show when I was like 23, 24. And To me, it was a lesson of like, even the dream that you think you have can be a limit to you. So I feel like I am living my dream now, but it's not like a dream fulfilled. And I don't even think that it has been fully formed yet. I think I'm accomplishing goals um, and I am definitely reaching marks that I wanted to reach. But I don't even like to tell myself that I'm in the dream because I think there's so much more that I could do. 100%. I, I totally relate to that. Do you feel like, well, let me ask you, when you were young, was the dream to be this or was the dream to kind of be on? You know what I mean? Because sometimes, at least in this world, in sports and entertainment, you don't quite know what it is you want to do, but you know you want it and you want that feeling of being regarded for your work. Or did you really imagine yourself as this on air personality? The most honest thing I could say to that is that I knew that I wanted to do this, but above all, I felt like I wanted to be significant. Yeah. I've always had that feeling. I think most people that have decided to be on television or be in media also have that feeling, but they think that saying that out loud is like, a vain idea or like a self-serving idea, but I don't view it in that way. I think that I always wanted what I had to say or the work that I was doing to mean more than to just me. Yeah. And that's what significance is to me. And so that was that was somewhat of my North Star. It's like, how can I have a real impact? How can I actually move the needle? How can what I'm doing feel important to the grand scheme of things? And this is all kind of the manifestation of that. And I think some people believe it to be the other way around, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Do you think at this point when you think about like how the dream keeps evolving that there really is nothing that you maybe couldn't do and that you're open to any of this? Yeah. I mean, and that's how I've tried to sculpt my career. I have felt at different points in time being put into a box And I knew that the only way to get out of that box was to almost like force myself out of it. The first half of my career when I was at the Big Ten Network, loved that job, set such a good foundation for me. I was also just so lucky that that was my first job. But I was there and I was like a correspondent on the show. Loved it, learned a lot. But very quickly, I felt like I was in a box and I didn't just want to be seen as the correspondent on a show. 
So my agents and my team, we said, okay, we're going to go to New York. And I started working at SNY. I wanted to take on the number one market and see what it was like to cover New York teams and be a part of the illustrious New York media. Um, and I loved it. I got to host, anchor, report. Um, I did some sideline. But even when I was doing that, I it started to feel like I was doing too much of what everyone else was doing. So I said, okay, I'm going to start doing this podcast, attaching it to it, because I knew what I loved above all else was interviewing others. So I started doing the podcast and I would just have different athletes come to SNY. I'd sit with them for an hour. KD came and did one of those. That was one of the biggest ones that I had there was him coming right off of that championship. Um, and so I'm doing the show. And then I just started to feel like, okay, I know interviewing is what I want to do, but I don't feel like that's the box I'm in right now. How can I dedicate to doing just that? Then Bleach Report came along and wanted to give me a show where all I did was interview people. And now... I I believe that I am known as an interviewer and that it is all encompassing. And then even when I was doing that, I started to feel like, okay, I think people think I'm just the NBA girl, that I'm just interviewing NBA players, that I can't do more. So we added in Thursday Night Football. Because I think that when you're mapping out your career, you should do all the things that you are capable of doing. And the trick in this, I think, especially for women, is they want you to think that the box is the landing area. Like that when you get into this space, when you have already made it to be a journalist and made it to be a host, like that's the success. But it's still like a limit. If I can also do things in entertainment, why wouldn't I just because someone thinks I only work in sports? You know, if I can interview a politician or and a football player and an NBA player and an exec and a coach, like why can't I also do that? Um, so not only do I feel like, you know, I want to be able to do all the things that I can, I feel like at this point I have. Like I've tried to prove that with every step that I've taken in my career. Do you know how young you are, though? Yeah, I do think I'm young. I think I'm very young. Because the way you're talking about some of these roles that you've had, it like is amazing to think that you've accomplished so much in such a short time. And it's probably come easy to you, but it's also come with tons and tons of work and no, and no again, and then a yes, and you having to kick the door down. But what do you think has been your kind of early secret to success a bit? Beyond your skill, there's a bit of navigating in order to say, you know what, I'm going to move to New York, and I'm going to get on SNY. But if I'm a young woman or, or a young man trying to be in this business, and I hear you say that, it's not as easy for everyone. There was real work that you had to do to get these opportunities. What do you think that's been for you this early? That's a really good question. You know, I think um, sort of similar to the conversation that we were just having, I believe that it really has been me. Like, it's who I am. The same way that anybody who is able to succeed in a thing, you think that it is solely because of the work, which to me implies that if somebody does that exact same work, they get yeah. to the, the exact same place. But it's not true. Yeah, It's the work paired with who you are as an individual. And it is, I think, the person that makes the career. Um, and it's the person that that sort of curates what they want their life to look like. So as much as it is the work, it was also like my vision and I think who, who I am. Um, and I don't think I've ever believed that I couldn't do something that I wanted to do. That's largely because my parents, they just sort of instilled like and irrational confidence in me <laughs> growing up every day. They told me if I put my mind to something, I could do it. Um, but that's how I think everybody should think about everything. Yeah. You can do it if you like allow yourself and give yourself space to do it. So, and you grew up in Atlanta. Yeah. Gwinnett County, the suburbs. Yeah. Your father was an athlete. Mm -hmm. Were you an athlete as a kid? I mean, I played in high school. I played growing up, but I was in no way an elite athlete. I actually got it put into uh, the Gwinnett County Hall of Fame last week. And it was funny because yes. everyone else is like an elite athlete. I'm like, oh, my one season of track really le <laughs> left an impact. I know. You know, what's funny is I played basketball like as a young person and I thought I was good. And when I worked in the music industry, if you asked me if I played ball, I was like, hell yeah, I hoop. Yeah. <laughs> And as soon as I started working in sports, my answer started changing. Totally. And, totally. And now if you ask me, no, nah, I didn't play nah, basketball. Yeah. I'm like, y'all got it. It's a different thing. Yes. <laughs> I was playing for fun. But yeah, I, I wasn't an athlete like some of the people in my family. I went with the first like skills camp of Kevin's that I went to. I remember um, 
his brother, Randy, was watching me shoot threes in the corner and they didn't know. They were like, wow, Rich can really shoot it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'm hyped for a second, right? And <laughs> Kevin looked over, he's like, this shit's nasty. And I'm like, oh my God. I hear this, yeah. You can hear that, right? <laughs> yeah, just flippant, like swatting you away. <laughs> yeah, just like, that shit's nasty. And yeah. I'm like, I don't play ball. <laughs> That's my new answer. I, tell, I yeah. don't play ball. It's like every now and then I get some shots up. Yeah, That's exactly. what I say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but did like a love for sports come from your father being an athlete like that? Yeah, I mean, it came from my dad who played football, my uncle who played baseball, my mom who was like the biggest football fan that I know. It was just always a part of our home. And even though I was not an athlete, I have always been a competitor. My dad and I competed in literally every single thing. And I never won, never won, because he's who he is. But I was always right there. And I just enjoyed what it meant to be wanting to like separate yourself. That's always been really fun. And I think that's really just what it means to be, to be a competitor. But I feel very lucky that I grew up around so many elite athletes. It also gave me, I think, a different perspective um, that I understand what it takes to be an elite athlete from them. But I also know that who you are as a person is more important than that too. And I try to have that shine in my work as well. So did you watch in this like family gathering around the television and point to someone on television and go, I'm going to be that. That's what I want to do. I didn't necessarily point to someone and say, I want to be that, but I had people that I really admired. Like growing up, we had Monica Pearson or Monica Kaufman, whichever we want to call her, her maiden name right now. Um, but she was where you got the news from. I used to love sitting down and just watching the news with my mom. I loved their voice and like the cadence of how they how they spoke about things. I'd always try to mimic it. So she was big to me. I always loved Pam Oliver, of course. I mean, who doesn't? That's the one who most vividly sticks out to me probably because she looked the most like me. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we've we had Falcon season tickets my whole life. I've always rooted for the dogs and the Falcons and the Hawks. So watching a lot of broadcasts, but I, I hear announcers more than I see faces when I think about growing up. That's interesting. Yeah. Just singing in the background as like the soundtrack to your home. Yeah, and I hear like my dad telling me about the games more than I do what was going on in the games, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So as your dreams have evolved, has that kind of North Star, you know, what Pam Oliver was, has that evolved now to new models for you as you continue to grow? Oh, totally. I mean, there are so many people that I like look up to and admire the work that they do. I mean, I say this all the time. I think one of the best interviewers ever is Howard Stern. He's very shock jockey, but he is the best. Like you sit in that chair, you know, you're, he's going to get something out of you, something that you've never heard. Um, something that might be a bit salacious, but still incredibly entertaining. He's not afraid to ask anything good or bad. Um, I obviously feel the same way about Oprah. The way she's able to construct questions is just amazing. Um, I feel this way about Terry Gross on NPR, who is really great at understanding people and good at follow-ups, which is the most underrated part of interviewing is follow-ups. Um, uh, who else do I really, really love? I mean, of course, look up to Carrie, look up to Jamel. I get a lot of joy from just like my peers, whether it's Maria or Joy or Malika. Like I I just think we're in a time right now where there's space for so many types of people, which is really cool. So do you watch film? Do you watch back people's shows? Oh, yeah. And I watch back all of mine. But I, I try to tune into, and this is the thing I would say to anybody that is coming up in media you have to consume like everything that you can because the best things you can have on your side are A, information, but B, style. Like when you have people that are your favorites, it's because you like their style. There's something about how they deliver, how they ask a question, how they present on camera that like brings something out of you that makes you relate to them. And the only way I think to effectively understand what your style is to also understand what your style isn't. Like, and the only way you can do that is by constantly learning. So I watch everyone's stuff. And I mean, like, from the most famous sportscaster to somebody who's just coming up. I think it's really important. And how is that kind of like sorority of your peers? Do you guys give each other game? Do you find and feel support from yeah, the other women in your field? For sure. I, I would actually say, not that you think this, but I, I think it's a misconception that women don't support women in this space. Because it is such a unique experience to be a woman in sports. 
And because it's a unique experience, it can at times feel very isolating. And the only way to get out of that feeling, to not feel as though you're alone, is to be in real fellowship and communication with other people that understand it. There is nobody that understands what it's like to be a woman in sports, except for a woman in sports. So we really need each other. And I think that, unfortunately, for some, in some aspects, women have let men almost decide who they're going to like. And what I mean by that is an environment has been created where there can only be one woman. But that is not like the fault of the women. That's the fault of the systems that are in place. And we can't like feed into what those systems are because if we also start to think there can only be one woman, then there for sure will always only be one woman. So having those real relationships and real friendships and actually supporting one another I think is how you create that real change moving forward for people to understand what we actually want to see. Yeah. And do you feel like that change has in some ways been expedited by also you talk about the unique time for women in sports. It's also an incredibly unique and special time for women's sports, period. Oh, yeah, for sure. I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. So, of course, I am thrilled at all of the eyes that are now on women's sports. I think we are truly in one of the most important moments just in terms of attention and spotlight on what women are doing in their sports. I think though we can't we can't fail them. And sometimes it feels as though the coverage, the narratives, the discourse around women's sports has not moved as quickly as the eyes on women. And that's why we're hearing so many people maybe misspeak about a subject or make a young woman feel a way that that she shouldn't. The commentary and all of our information and our knowledge has to meet the moment. And I don't necessarily know if right now it is meeting the moment. I completely agree with you. I'll give you an example of what I think you're saying. About two years ago when Sabrina was a rookie, she came with me to Kevin's birthday and she came with a bunch of her teammates. And Two or three people that were at the club saw them walk in and brought them over to where we were all sitting and they were kind of clearing out of the way. And the person that brought them over introduced her, Sabrina, in front of all of her teammates to a bunch of guys that were sitting at the booth with us. And they said, this is the greatest female basketball player in the world right here, pointing to Sabrina. She hadn't even played or she had only played one year in the league. And that was because of the hype that Sabrina had gotten. But imagine how she felt in front of her teammates or how her teammates felt. And that would never have happened in the NBA, right? You never would have had even Wemby. You would never have the first pick in the draft or a really renowned young person in the league walk into a room and someone have the gall to say, this is the greatest basketball player in the world. But everyone is aware that there's eyeballs on women's sports, but the need to go educate yourself on the sport, the differences in the sport, who these women are, what their stories are, what the stakes are, is important. Very. Because what you're probably saying is there's like this hollow coverage in some ways. And while the coverage is incredible because there was none. It isn't complete. It's not complete. Yeah, completely. And your example was spot on. It's it's exactly what I mean. I think people are mistaking having some of the story for having the full story without even realizing that the reason that they have that view is that they are in some ways diminishing what women's sports even is. How how almost, um, I'll say ignorant for lack of a better word, how ignorant do you have to be to think that if you watch something for a day or two, that you're an expert, <laughs> right? To, to have consumed a piece of information about Sabrina in your example and feel as though that's the story. We don't do that with anything else. We don't do it with anything else. We are consuming all of this and then thinking that it makes us experts. And the reason that can be damaging is when the people that are actually supposed to be deemed as experts in the field are doing the same thing. And that's why who covers stories is important, how we get the story, how we talk about athletes, the language that we use, all of that matters. Because if we want this moment to be more than just a moment, which Honestly, at this point, I feel very confident that it is. We really have to meet it in real ways. And that is a responsibility on all of us in the media um, to make sure we are seeing them in their fullness and seeing the sport in their fullness. How do you start 
to integrate that into what you do to kind of help that move along a bit? Yeah, no, that's such a good question. I mean, I've been having, to me, you have to have conversations. You have to have conversations with people that have actually lived it. So I have a lot of conversations with Sue Byrne about this exactly, what we aren't doing enough of, what she thinks some of these issues are. And every single time I talk to her, I am just further enlightened because it's a thing that I maybe didn't even think about. Um, and so I think it's it's really crucial to talk to others that have lived it. I think even for me, I primarily cover men's sports and I have thought about ways I can really use my platform to make sure more eyes are on it, um, but also give them the same kind of coverage. You should have a sit down interview where you get to be who you are. You should be able to talk about yourselves in these ways where you haven't always been given the space. And so I want to be able to give my platform and the demographic of fans that I have to those women who maybe haven't been introduced to them in their fullness, right? They see somebody like Angel Reese and they know what they have picked up through the tweets, but that's not a full picture of somebody. And so I want to be somebody who can paint a full picture of these women because they are more than just one thing, yeah. the same way the male athletes are. But it's actually a pretty interesting opportunity for someone like yourself. Because if you look at the way men's basketball is covered, respectfully, outside of certain people like yourself, it's just gone so far in a different direction it from has. where I would have loved to see it or what I want to consume. And that's what gets the attention. So for women's sports, as you start this coverage, it's like, how do we begin that conversation without having to be divisive yep. and insulting and clickbaity? And maybe this is a way, you know, you look at what JJ and LeBron are doing and it's refreshing to hear sports covered in that way. And that's very high level, sophisticated conversation, but there's space for that. For sure. But I'd also say, cause like, I agree with you, nothing should be intentionally divisive in anything in media, but- I think there also does have to be room in women's sports for those kind of clickbaity moments only because that is some of the things that drives people's interest in men's sports. We like the drama. I think sports is like wrestling. Like you have a heel, you have someone you're rooting for, like that's a part of it. So when Diana Taurasi comes on and says that Caitlin Clark is, you know, going to have a learning curve because she's going from playing with young women to playing with the best in the world. But people are viewing what Diana Taurasi is saying as like a mean thing to Caitlin. You would never think that if a, if a man said that about the rookie coming in. No. Like for women's sports to continue to stay in sort of this like cultural zeitgeist that it's in, there has to be like conversations like Diana is having. You have to also, like it can't all be good. Yeah. It has, it, there has to be a balance. That's one of the reasons we like consuming sports. Um, I just thought that was really interesting, the reaction to what Diana said. When you hear like men's basketball players say that all the time about the new talent coming in. So it's it's this balance of like not treating it with almost almost like kitty gloves, but also making sure that we are at least informed with the takes, even when they are more polarizing. Is it an informed polarizing take? Yeah. I agree. I, I think it's almost like back to the idea of the lack of education around it. Cause it's when Jay will said the same thing about Caitlin. Yeah. People were in an uproar, but it if was you crazy. understood, you would know that what they were saying was valid and real and said, like you said, every day on game day and first take as it regards to men. Yeah, for sure. It's like, dude, what is it that, that you want from this? Do you want to have this feel like sports and all the things that we love about it? Or do you want this to just be PR? The PR is boring. Yeah when we're talking about sports. And it's okay if in women's sports, people are reflected in that way, again, if it is informed. The wrestling analogy is spot on, minus it being a real sport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wrestling's not real? I know, I just found that out myself. Um, but, you know, it's what sells, and it is what, like, in some ways, forces you to dig deeper and learn. Totally, totally. That's, it's important. And we, we have to, it has to be a full 360 view. So what are you expecting from this season? The WNBA will be more attention uh, worthy yeah. than ever no, before? For, no, for sure it will. I, this is maybe not exactly what you're asking, but I'm very interested to see the almost um, 
the comparison between how we will be discussing the WNBA and how we'll be discussing college and how that gap is like going to close. Because in my opinion, and I would I would love to hear yours, I have felt as though the W has not gotten the attention that it deserves. And neither has like college sports, but it has gotten more than the W, it feels like. Even when you hear people have these conversations about whether or not a player should stay in school, obviously I get it when it comes to just like the fiscal standpoint of it, the money that you're making, I understand. But the fact that that's even a conversation about whether you want to go play with the best of the best and be pro or stay in this place where you have all this attention and all this money, the conversation should actually be, how can we make it the same in both? Yeah. As opposed to stay at Iowa for another year. Yeah. So I want to see if that evolves anymore and if we can get it closer to to what the college side looks like. The way the way you just said that actually, now that I think about it, is it's ridiculous. It's crazy. That someone would encourage Caitlin to play against subpar competition when she has the opportunity to go to the next level. I mean, that's what the love is about. That's what it's about. When you are an elite athlete, that's what you do this for. That's what you do this for. And I need to flesh out a little more what I think about this, but these are just the, the thoughts that I've had in a conversation I was having with Sue as well. Sometimes I think with with female athletes, we almost view the fact that they are playing their sport as a means to something. And that's not how we see men playing the sport. The men are playing the sport to be a champion because they want to be one of the best, because they've worked their entire life for it. But sometimes when you talk about women playing sports, even the elite of the elite, It's about how they are inspiring others, which is incredibly important. You should be inspired when you are watching other people. And I know that they want to inspire. But being an inspiration is still a service to someone else. We talk about how women inspire. We talk about how, you know, the skills that they are getting as being athletes and how it can carry them into other things. Very rarely, it's just like, you are going to be the best in this thing. And that is why you are playing. It's like aspirational to a fault in a way, but it isn't that way for men. I guess I need to like think about it a little more, but I've I've really been recognizing this um, with how we speak about uh, women athletes. Do you get what I'm saying? I do totally you agree? get what you're saying. I okay. do agree completely. Yeah. And I think your point about college basketball is an interesting one. This next year, like you said, will be very telling. I think there's some things, um, obviously, Caitlin Angel, this whole narrative, like we talked about, has just been iconic and has been important and has carried the momentum into this what will be an exciting year in the WNBA. And I think when you look at college with Juju and Paige and Dawn and her dominance in South Carolina, I think you'll still get a ripple effect of attention on college. I don't think you'll lose it For right sure. away. And Juju could end up being the best of them all. Mm-hmm. But do you think that the idea that women's college basketball is during the basketball season is a benefit to it? And in some ways, the WNBA playing during the summer has been a hindrance at all. Mm. That's a good point. I've never really thought about it in that way. You know, people in a basketball state of mind yeah. during the winter, during March Madness for both men and women, during the playoff chase for men, it's all like top of mind to you. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to be something that keeps the WNBA from ultimately growing, but it's something that I've always thought, um, and it's too late now, but years ago, I always imagined the WNBA being on like the off day, you know, like we're all in a basketball mindset. I just went to see the Knicks play. I want to go see the Liberty play. Mm -hmm. And it's probably tough logistically. And I'm not trying to uproot the system. Yeah. But I do think that there's something to how fans have kind of seen that time of year and women's college basketball had a platform waiting for it in some ways. Yeah. I think that playing into routine is always helpful, right? When you are expecting something to be away and you're adding more, you will you are more likely to to get more of what you're expecting. But you would think that for people who really love basketball, the idea of having it year round would be enticing. That during the summer you can watch the WNBA and then when that's over you can go back to NBA and you would think that's almost like a that's a fantasy land for a basketball fan. So it's actually, I think, more interesting that it hasn't been that way, that the summer hasn't been like the paradise for people because yeah. you can get more, that that it is even, you know, a question of like why 
this is or isn't working. It's like, if it's the only thing on, and if you like basketball, you can get that basketball fix, you can turn on the WNBA. Well, I think that's going to change this summer. And that's why I was so happy that Dawn Staley said what she said after the game. Because when you're as popular as Caitlin is, you're going to have opinions on both sides. Yeah. There's going to be hate. It's going to happen. But you can't forget the role that she's played in helping this entire momentum swing. And I thought that was important because of just where Dawn sits and kind of the hierarchy. For sure. Um, back to you. Okay. <laughs> Me, I'm like, yeah, let's talk about other things. <laughs> Back to you, Taylor Rooks. You have, in a short time, not only become very successful, but you've become a public figure in your own right. And it, like you said, has to do with you. I don't think from knowing you now for seven years that you've tried to do that, but your work and who you are has done that for you. Has it been something that you weren't anticipating or that you weren't maybe prepared for? And then the second part of that is how has that in some ways been a challenge for you interviewing public figures as you've become a bit of one yourself? It's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I anticipated it to the extent that it has gotten to at this point. I do believe that I have, have been very prepared for it. I don't think that I really had a choice. Like I was... When I was in school at University of Illinois, I was like breaking recruiting stories. I was like a very premier news source when it came to Illinois basketball and football. Like I would be on campus and someone in my class would like want to take a pick. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then when I went to Big Ten Network, I was like carrying over some of those same Big Ten fans that were now watching the network. And keep in mind, I got that Big Ten Network job when I was, I had just turned 22. So Although I'm young, I have been doing this for quite some time. And when I started, it was very like, you're thrown into the fire and this is what your life is going to look like now. I think my life moved really quickly um, in some good ways and in some bad ways. But I have started to ask myself more now, probably more that now than ever, how big do I want to be? Um, I believe the answer to be very big because... That is just what I have always wanted to do was really mean something in the media space. But I know now, too, there's so many other things that come with it. I think I am talked about differently than most women in the space. Um, I think I'm seen differently than most women in the space. Um, but I also think, you know, I encounter people and get opportunities that are different than most women in the space because of the aforementioned, too. So it is somewhat of a double-edged sword and I do think I am prepared for it, but I have certainly started to become more cognizant of what it actually means to not just be an interviewer, but be somebody that people are really interested in. Um, and I don't really know when it got here, but it certainly is here. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> well, as a friend, please let your star shine as bright as it can be. Yeah, for sure. Because as you said, you don't want to be boxed in. And I think you're breaking ground in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you feel like you're seen or talked about? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think that there is a large fascination on who I am as a person, whether that is just me privately in my personal life, but also a huge fascination with the network of people that I know. I think that sometimes people are trying to understand, you know, maybe why is she so liked or why do people want to hang out with her? And when you have all of these questions, what you do is try to create the story in your head that is the most entertaining. Or I would take it a step further to say the story in your head that mo that best explains why it isn't you. And I think that that happens with me a lot. Um, I think people want to create narratives in their head that just make them have fun for that day. But it's interesting. I am always, 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 always going to be seen differently because I'm a woman, even though I am doing all of the things that men do. Someone that I love is Ahmad Rashad. I think that he was really able to, of course, have great relationships with people like Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing. But what he capitalized on most was the fact that he was seen as a peer. He was their peer. He was somebody that they wanted to be around. And there's men in the media space now that are able to capitalize on being seen as a peer, even if the only commonality that they have with athletes is that they're men. So what does that mean for women? 
Am I supposed to not be able to enter into those same sort of spaces and build those exact same kind of relationships just because I'm not a man? That doesn't make sense to me. I have been able to interview the way that I have, like I said, be in the rooms the way that I have, build real trust with athletes and have real relationships with athletes because I did not want the fact that I wasn't a man stop me from doing that. I was only able to get as far as I got because I didn't view being even a woman as a box that I was in. All of these are just things like you're battling what you want to do versus what people expect of you. And the thing that people expect of me is much less than what I expected myself. It's still a limit. And what I want to do means doing a lot of the same things that men have been able to do. And that is always what what my guiding kind of light is. Do you feel like some of your friends, some of these players that you've become close with and um, have been interviewing for years now, has it been awkward at times or has it changed your relationships seeing how big of a star you become? I mean, I know the first time I remember one of the first times you interviewed Kevin and just to think about we were at a restaurant. You remember? Yeah, I do. And to think about, you know, I knew who you were then, but how far you've come. And obviously your relationship with us has never changed. But do you ever get that sense from some of the players in the league that may in some ways be intimidated by kind of who you become? Maybe yes, but I I view it as an advantage. Like there are people that seek out wanting to come onto the show. Yeah, I think for some people it feels like a moment that they were able to be on the show and and be interviewed by me, and I take a lot of pride in that because not only you know does it make the content and the product like a destination, it, it continues to solidify me as one. That if I sit in her chair, people will see it, people will talk about it, she asks me good questions, but I'm also like. She's somebody that I that I have watched. And so that that makes me really happy. And then when I think about the athlete relationships that I have, I actually think as I've gotten bigger or more noticeable, I relate much more to some of the things that the athletes go through on a much smaller scale, but I get it. And I think as I've gotten bigger, I've actually gotten a lot closer um, to a lot of the friendships that I have. I feel that way about Kevin, you know, like, when I met Kevin, I literally just started. I was in college. He gave me a, no, a yes when most people always want to give you a no. And I have seen him grow. And we always talk about that through him growing, I have also grown. He has seen me just be a host. He has seen me interview. He has seen me interview people that nobody knew their names. <laughs> and now I'm able to really have, you know, the stars in the space. Um, and so I think that even just through that, through the work, through the dedication um, and always trying to be different um, has created stronger relationships too. Are you close enough with any of these guys to tell them not to start podcasts? <laughs> Honestly, yes. And I've had a few don't do a podcast conversations to be honest with you. <laughs> are there too many? There are, there are too many podcasts that have the potential to hurt hurt you. That's what I'd say. I don't think that it's that there are too many. I don't think there are enough good ones. That's that's kind of my my stance. That's a on good it. answer. Yeah. There's not enough good ones. I'll say that. Well you'll never say that publicly because one thing that I think everyone appreciates you for is you really are fearless in standing up for athletes. Yeah. And you do always speak out. Is that something that you just felt like was a responsibility in being friends with so many and entering into that world as a peer like Ahmad Rashad is you also are fearless in saying, nah, this is wrong. What you said was wrong. And this, what you said about this person is wrong. And I think people really do appreciate that and trust you because of that. Well, I think it's important. And I think we all have a responsibility to this job. And what that responsibility is, is to give your opinion and tell people what you feel, again, in an informed way. And the way media has been, I would say it is shifting some. The person who gets the short end of the stick is the subject. And if we are not approaching the subject with real empathy, real understanding, um, a perspective that is outside of our own, then we're actually doing a disservice to not just the athlete, but the viewer too. So when we enter into these spaces, if it is a media member saying something I don't agree with, you have to see, again, the whole picture. And I think that's sort of the role that I play. And it's also what I try to do in my interviewing too. I don't want anybody to step into the chair 
and I am like leading the thing that they're saying. I just want you to show up as you and we're going to get to to the heart of it. And that is what I want the work to be. And if sometimes that means standing up for an athlete, that's a byproduct of what I think the meat of my purpose is. Yeah. The NFL was something that when I saw you were starting, I was excited for you. I mean, it's part of your evolution. What was that as a challenge for you? What kind of change was that? What is the kind of climate of working in that same capacity around football players around the NFL as comparison to the NBA? For sure, a new space. You know, interviewing is interviewing, but the logistics around it are certainly different. I think interviewing NBA players, they tend to be a bit more individualistic, not as people, but just in the system that they are a part of. It encourages that. Um, they they don't feel as we are talking about themselves. I think on the NFL side of things, it does tend to be a bit more team focused, but also a bit more sport focused. In these interviews, we are talking about things that have happened on the field um, and you know the narrative surrounding how they are on the field. So getting used to that, there was certainly a learning curve for sure. There's also less time. I don't know if people really understand that when we do the features for Thursday Night Football, you're with that athlete for 15 minutes, 15, maybe 20 if you're lucky. So you have to get to the heart of their story. You have to make them feel comfortable, make them want to answer honestly and not give you the same old locker room talk that we hear within 15 minutes. Whereas on my show, I'm sitting with you for an hour and we're talking about whatever we want. It's just a different feeling. So there was there was a learning curve, some for that, but it has made me exponentially better because the the just it's rapid you get there and you better figure it out like this last season we were we had a Raiders game and we were supposed to be interviewing Devontae Adams so I found out I was interviewing Devontae Adams I had you know prepped all of the day before the night before and we get there and Devontae gets sick and we learn this like five minutes before the interview is supposed to start but it's Thursday night football we need to have a feature we got to figure it out Uh, We asked for Max Crosby. Max says, shout out to Max, by the way, he's the best. He said, yes, he would he would do it. So I had to prep for a Thursday night football feature for Max Crosby in 15 minutes. Not that we spoke for just 15 minutes. I had to prep for it in 15 and we did it. And it was one of the best ones, I think, that we did. But I was only able to do that because I had a season under my belt of what this looks like. Yeah. I had the tape both on Max, but all, but on myself. So it just moves differently. It's not the same even like routine as you get in the NBA. And when you're in these like pre-production meetings, is there even a desire to try to stir up anything? It does feel like now that you say it, that the NFL for the most part outside of maybe Aaron Rodgers coverage or OBJ coverage every once in a while. It is about on the field. It is about the game. And in reality, that's the kind of information we consume the most. The NFL is still the biggest sport by far. I wonder if that's actually hurt the NBA in some ways. It has brought this incredible amount of attention. But I wonder if it has hurt the game in some ways. And I would imagine, yes, if LeBron and JJ, for instance, felt the need to do something, to cut through a bit. The NFL must be refreshing in that way. And I'm sure it comes with its issues as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But that is something that like now that you pointed out is something that is very obvious to me. For sure. With Mind of the Game pod, which is truly brilliant. I, I think JJ is just such a media star, but that show, it really is. It's just about the game. Yeah. It's the X's and O's of it. And the fact that that didn't exist when you really think about it, is probably a failing on someone's part. Without question. Because before that, where did you go just to learn more? Where'd you go? Where do you go? Yeah. And so they they fulfilled a need. And of course, it's cutting through because it didn't exist. But I think we should examine why it didn't exist. But the thing about that, though, is that actually means examining the consumer. Because the reason that NBA media is how it is now, whether it's debatey or hot takey or feeding into drama, whatever, it's because that's what people watch. It's what we wanted. It's what we wanted. So it's a bit of a give and take, and you don't really necessarily know who you're supposed to like blame in that. But in my opinion, most of the blame goes to the consumer. What you watch on TV or on your phone is a result of interest. These 
channels aren't just talking about this because they want to. <laughs> They're putting it out there because you have shown that you are interested in it. So while people might complain about how we talk too much about, you know, things happening off the court or too much opinion, too personality driven, you have shown, the data shows us that you actually don't want that, right? It's the same when you think about these, like, when you think about some rappers and musical artists, whenever someone puts out the, the a new album, people say, he not rapping anymore. Like, I don't see him really rapping. Like, where are the lyrics? Where's the message? But on the album, that song exists. Yeah, Y'all didn't listen to it, but you listen to the hits, right? And so I am giving the people what it is they want. And I think the NBA is also kind of working in that space too. You know what we can blame it on? What? What? We blame everything on what? social media. Yeah, no, probably. That's become the thing for everything. It has. But I think there's some truth to that. It's, it is. Yeah, it <laughs> it's is. Social media. It is. Do you think social media has done more harm or more good? Uh, well, I think it's probably right down the middle. Yeah. And the harm side of it is just so much more dangerous and scary than the good. Uh, people have built businesses. Totally. People have connected with people around the world. I, it's endless, but it's scary. It's scary. I don't know if you saw this book that just came out, The Anxious Generation. It's like no. a New York Times bestseller. And it's just about how physically and emotionally destroyed young people are by social media and how quickly it's all happened. I mean, this isn't decades and decades of evolution. This right. is two decades at most. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you because- I owe a very, very, very large part of my career to social media, right? A very large part of it. So I am in no way just sitting here and bashing what social media has done. But social media, I think its worst thing is that it has not allowed people to be critical thinkers. That to me is like the worst part well, of social media. I completely agree with you. And the lack of critical thinking is, is what's leading to everything else. People on social media believe that if you post a tweet and a photo, it's true. People, again, want to believe the thing that is the most entertaining, even if it has, it is not based in any reality. And so the more and more we are feeding pure entertainment to others, but not actual thought, of course, we're going to be like, everything is going to reflect that. Um, and there's, a bunch of things that are wrong with it. But I think that's probably the worst. How it has influenced common thought because there's a lack of it online. Yeah. Well, you know where there is not a lack of common thought? What? I love this segue. <laughs> Your new show with Joy. Yes, too personal. We love it. I'm so excited. I love doing it. I love doing it. And honestly, as we talk about sort of um, what men have been able to do in their careers, maybe women haven't always felt like, I was like watching Stephen A and I was watching Shannon Sharp and I'm like, Whew, so that alone is intense. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I'm like, so, you know, they can go online and have these conversations about sex and women's butts and no one says anything. I would. And, <laughs> but I'm like, you know what? Good. You are doing everything you're capable of. No, you're right. And I believe in that. But then we should all get to do that. And I think for Too Personal, it's just we are more than just sports media members. We have lives. We have friends. We have things we love. We have things we hate. And we should be granted that same sort of space to be whole people that a lot of the men have been able to. And if I'm being really honest with myself, I wish I would have started doing something like this earlier. But again, I think when you're a woman, you have this thing in the back of your head, which is, have I done enough to be able to enter into that space? And I really had to sit down with myself and say, look at what you've built up to this point, and you are selling yourself short to think you can't show more of who you are. And I just reached a point where I wanted like that resume to speak for me and say, she's done this. We know that she can. Her doing this is not going to take away from that. Um, and I think I've landed here, and I've really enjoyed doing the show with Joy. I think it's amazing. And I think... You know, I understand what you mean about Stephen A. and Shannon. And I do think that more power to everybody. Kick every door down. Talk about what you want, especially if the consumer continues to consume it. Yeah. But I think the example with you guys is different because when I watch the two of you do that show, if I closed my eyes, I wouldn't think this was two women from the sports world. Yeah. 
Um, I like to hear that. That's the goal. <laughs> and it, it's working because I also think that at the point the two of you are at, it's like you're you're talking to the audience, but you're also experiencing life in real time. You're curious in your own right. And you're very human in how the two of you communicate with each other. Yeah. Um, and that's different than your examples, you know, about Stephen and Shannon talking about music or politics or entertainment. I think this was a show that was needed, but I'm not a young woman. I don't know that. Um, I enjoy it. But did you feel like young women needed this show? Did you get that feeling from your fans, from the audience, or just from what you know that this was something that was needed? Yeah, because again, we think that just context and nuance is missing with everything. And the way that we talk about each other, I think it damages how we view men, how we view women. It damages how we view friendships, how we view the world. Because people think when you enter into conversations, you pick a side and that's your side. And there's nowhere in the middle where you can find any sort of common ground or even just discuss your experiences. People aren't honest. That's also something I've realized through doing this show and also the ways that I think I haven't always been fully honest. And with the show... I really am pushing myself to be me fully and talk about things that I maybe wouldn't always feel comfortable with because the only way you have that growth, the only way you cut through and the only way women feel as though they relate is if you are honest, if you say what you are thinking out loud, but you do it in a way that um in a way that's real and in a way that isn't meant to just be like a trending topic or get clicks. It's this is my experience and this is how I felt about it. And I think we have to stop um we have to stop centering people when we have conversations. We have to actually center the thought behind it. So on the show, we're never gonna talk about celebrities because the celebrity specifically isn't what's important. It's like, okay, well, why do we care about what that celebrity did? What does that have to do with our lives? Why does everybody seem to have such a visceral reaction to this person that they do not know? And to me, that's more interesting because it's actually relatable to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And I just in generally think we should sort of stop celeb culture in the way that we do. <laughs> social media. Yeah, social media, for sure. But the honesty thing is is spot on. I even have struggled with that, um, you know, and this isn't my core job to be on air and speak, but as part of our brand, I do it. And- when I listen to earlier episodes, sometimes I'm like, what was I even saying? Why was I saying that? Same. Not that I was embarrassed at the inexperience I had, but I remember the first pod I ever did was with Jack Dorsey. And I was like, who is that person interviewing him? Like, why am I talking like that? Why did I phrase the question like that? Yeah. And why am I not speaking? And it's probably why you think Howard Stern is so great. He's unequivocally himself. He's always been. Why do you, why do you think you were? Confidence. Comfort. Yeah. And everybody, you know, and, and even saying that takes a level of confidence because I, I try to pride myself on being a very confident person, but there's two different confidences. It's like what's on the outside and what's on the inside. And sometimes what's on the inside can impact the outside and sometimes you can overcome it mm -hmm. and push yourself through. Some people that have social anxiety walk in a room and as soon as they walk in, all of it gets ripped off and they're the life of the party, but they still felt that level of angst before totally. they went on. Actors don't speak in public sometimes. They can't even be around people. And then you turn the camera on and they turn into someone else. But I think for me, it was just not feeling comfortable or confident enough or knowing or trusting that it was okay to say what I felt no matter what. Whereas yeah. I knew I could do that in any room, but when the camera was turned on, I didn't feel that way. And I think that's what comes across in your show with Joy. Like it does feel like you're like, you know what? Fuck it. Like yeah. this show, I'm going to say whatever I want. Yeah. Be embarrassed. Don't take yourself like so seriously. You know, I watched, I watched this uh, documentary called Everything is Copy. It was about Nora Ephron, who of course is just like the queen of, of rom-coms. And what they say in the documentary is that she would say everything is copy. You know, that everything that happened in her life should be for consumption for humor for people to better understand and one of the talking heads in it explained it as if you slip on a banana peel and people laugh it's their laugh but if you slip on a banana peel and you tell people about how you slip on a banana peel it's your laugh and you become like the hero of your own story 
And so I think there really is like power in being honest about yourself, even when it's embarrassing, even if it makes you look bad, because it's yours and you are creating whatever that narrative is. And so every time before I step in and do personal, I truly say like everything is copy. And most importantly, you are not as important as you think you are. That's the number two thing I say. <laughs> like you can say what this thing is and it's going to be okay because you move on to another thing the next day. We all feel like what we are saying is much more high stakes than it actually is. <laughs> it is such a, a magical moment in your life when you realize totally. you're not that important. 100%. And it takes you a bit to get there yes. for sure. But when you realize it, it's amazing. And then what has to happen, this is the the process as I see it. When you're younger, you think everything's that important. Yep. And you get to a phase where you're like, nothing's that important. Yes. But there is a middle ground. There's a middle ground. And you have to honor what has been established in some ways as important. Mm -hmm. you know, there's certain things, you know, I'll talk to athletes who will say, I'm not going to shit. I'm like, you don't have to. But let me just tell you what happens if you don't if do you it. If you don't. Let me just tell you where this goes. And then you still should be able to make that decision. But some things are important. And you even see that from certain artists. I remember Jay-Z's speech at Clive Davis's party a few years ago was like, which was a bit of a far cry from like some of the raps, which is like, I could buy billboards. So what is a billboard list? But then it was like, no, some of these things are just important. They are what they are. And you have to like strike that balance sometimes because Completely. you do want to have a fearlessness, but you do want to remember that certain things are the way they are for a reason. And, totally. And if you want certain things for yourself, you have to be very aware of like striking that perfect balance. Oh, 100%. And even just as I as I hear you, you know, talking about this and you talk about not being as important as you think and the narratives that I feel like surround me, there was a moment in time where it used to bother me when I would do these interviews and then everybody makes their joke about, oh, they're sitting in front of Taylor, like everybody's going to lie or over-exaggerate, whatever. That used to really bother me because I felt what people don't understand about interviewing, or at least with me, is that charisma is a skill. Making people feel comfortable is a skill. Being able to sit in a chair and get somebody to tell you something they've never said before is a skill. Now, because maybe to you, I make it look very easy. You are diminishing that skill to how I look. But this is how I am. This is how I do the job. And I think that when I realized that you just had to focus on that aspect of it, all that other stuff stopped mattering. And when I realized, again, I just am not as important as I think, it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to me that people thought that about me because I know that I'm the magic in these interviews. Facts. Those athletes are interviewed by multiple people trillions of times a year. And they don't get what I got because that's about me. And people can say whatever they want about whatever they want. But the proof is in what you see. That all of my interviews have a moment. All of them. Because I work for that. Being able to talk to people is a skill that I think is sometimes downplayed, again, uh, to make people feel a bit more comfortable about themselves. But when you, when you realize you're not as important, you stop caring as much about people saying that. It is such a skill. And I think that's probably the one thing that the amount of pods or the amount of access and social media, again, has kept us from fully understanding. Because you think about the legends and the people that Barbara Walters or Diane Sawyer, David Letterman, three random examples, but three people <laughs> that you just see their work and you realize they're flawless, like in how they do what they do. And it's no different than being the best at any skill or any profession. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm going to, I'm going to end with this question and I'm going to end it uh, in a different way than I was going to because okay. of what you said earlier. Okay. So I was going to ask you, what's the dream or where are we going? And I realize now that the question with you should just be today, mm -hmm. what is the dream? Because it's going to keep evolving. Yeah. And for someone like you, it should never be more than just how you're feeling today. For sure. No, I like how you phrase that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, so there's this paradox and it's called the ship of Theseus. And what it basically is, it's like um, there was this ancient warrior 
who brought his ship back to harbor. And he was like, great. So they kept the ship there as a memorial. But of course, over time, different parts of the ship would rot. So they would replace it with new parts. More would rot. They'd place it with new parts. Till eventually, everything on the ship is new. And the philosophical question they ask is, if all parts of this are new, is it still the ship of Theseus? And I think it's actually a much broader question about how we are always constantly changing. And if who I am today is so vastly different than who I was when I was 21, how am I still that same person? Or at least what parts of me from that still exist? So when I hear you talk about what it is that I want today, I think I think a lot more about the kind of person I want to be in 10 years and the thing that that person wants to show the world and the constant, my constant part on my ship of Theseus has been people. And it has been wanting to make people feel comfortable when they're talking to me, wanting them to feel seen and heard, but also wanting people that are watching my stuff to feel important and to have like a feeling. I always say like, I think about Oprah. When I would come home from school, I knew that everybody in every house was watching Oprah. And if you missed what Oprah said, you felt like you missed out. And so you were trying to catch up to learn about Oprah's interview. And so in 10 years or whatever it is, I want you to feel like you missed out if you didn't see what I was talking about or who I was talking to, if you didn't get my opinion, if you didn't hear my thoughts. That's what I want. It's so much more of like a feeling than it is a goal. Well, yep. You know, I, totally. that's what I want. Amazing. Yeah. Well, how do you feel after this interview? Amazing. <laughs> you are an A plus interviewer. I already knew that though, but you are. Sure. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Again, the power is in the glasses. It is in the glasses. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been such a joy. Um, and say hi to Joy for me. Of course I will. And I do, I do want to say this too, though. I feel like I've said this to you before, but what you have been able to build both personally with Kevin and just boardroom generally, I think is so special. And you've been able to so effectively merge culture and sports and the business of sports. I learn so much just when I hear you talk about things. I learn so much just from the boardroom Instagram. Like I, it makes me think about the space that we're in so differently. And I actually think like that's what your gift is, is that you make people see things differently and see people differently. Anytime I'm at an event that you have, that's how I walk away feeling. So I too just sort of want to give you your flowers because you have been nothing but a great friend to me. Also somebody I know I can come to just to ask a question because you have guided many things. So I just want to make sure that you Thank know that. You. Of course. Amazing. Of course. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and thanks for that again. Absolutely. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye.